Hey, welcome back to another episode of Learn Your Own Rules, the podcast. I'm your sole host, Ryan Krim. That's right, me by my lonesome. I'm the only person here to do this podcast, which is a shame because I'm the least articulate person I know. But that's not going to stop me, darn it. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to forge on, or at least until the Adderall wears off. This is a board gaming podcast about board games. We review board games. We talk about different board game experiences, but we don't go deep into the rules of playing specific board games. If you stumbled upon this podcast randomly and you weren't looking for a board gaming podcast, please stay. You might find something really cool. If you were looking for a board game podcast, I have to wonder why you stopped here rather than at somewhere better, but I'm glad to have you anyway. Today I'm going to follow my normal format here at Learn Your Own Rules, the podcast. I'm going to be talking about some games I've played recently, then I'm going to move on to my feature game of the week, which this week is Betrayal at House on the Hill. As a quick reminder, as I said before, I do not discuss rules here on Learn Your Own Rules, the podcast. I might reference some rules, but I won't go into them in depth. Please check the description of this video or this podcast for links that go to different YouTube channels that teach the games that I'm going to be talking about today if you'd like to know more about the rules at any point. And now on to my first game of the week, which is BattleCon, designed by D. Brad Dalton and published by Level 99 Games. I've talked about BattleCon for a couple of weeks now, and I've finally gotten a chance to play my Unleashed version, and it was great. It's a fantastic production, like I said before. One of the big differences the new version makes is it gives every fighter its own tuck box, which is super important. I had two expansions before, and they were all organized in a box with little makeshift dividers, and they worked fine, but every time I'd pull out BattleCon to play it, I'd open it up, take a look at the mess of components and the cards inside the box, and then just put it away. I didn't want to try to pull it out and sort it. Part of that is because I knew that the Unleashed version was coming with the tuck boxes, and so I was hoping to, so I was wanting to capitalize on using those tuck boxes and, and to allow the game to be better organized, easier to set up, easier to play. I'm pleased to report that that is the case. The game is infinitely easier to just pull out and play than it was before. Open a box, grab the tuck boxes for the characters you want to play, and you're basically ready to go for the most part. I also really like the idea of the tuck boxes because realistically you could grab a couple of those tuck boxes, stick them in your game bag, and take them to a game night, provided you know what characters you and another person want to play, and you can easily make the game transportable. You wouldn't have a board for the character spaces and all that, but Exceed gets around that very easily by using cards to represent the spaces on the board, and you could do the same thing here. I wouldn't say that I like everything about the Unleashed box, though. Although, to be fair, I don't mean specifically the Unleashed box. This is edition 4 of BattleCon, and I don't really like a couple of the changes, primarily in the tokens. In previous versions of BattleCon, you received not just the board to play the game on, but you also received a set of dials, and these dials are what you use to track your health and your force. Force being like meter in a fighting game. Resources you can use to make more powerful attacks, use your special abilities, things like that. The dials were really useful. They did a great job of consolidating the information of how much health you had and how much force you had. For some reason, they've taken that concept a different route in Unleashed. Instead of having dials, there are a pile of tokens that you use to track your health and your force instead. This isn't a big deal, but it is far more fiddly to have a stack of 45 force tokens sitting next to the board and 20 health tokens sitting in front of your character, when before all you needed was a dial, your cards, and then whatever few other tokens or resources your specific character needed. They've also fine-tuned the way the round system works. In BattleCon, you used to play to 15 rounds, and whoever was ahead in life after 15 rounds won the game. Now you play until force runs out, so theoretically I think the games can actually go longer, because you start with two force out of 45, you take one every round, or the end of every round, unless you're at seven or less health, in which case you take two force. And there are some cards or abilities that can allow you to gain more force. But theoretically, you could have the game last longer than 15 rounds if you're taking too long to deal damage to the other player. That hasn't been something that I've seen be an issue, certainly not since I got the new release, but I could see that being a potential concern. I like the redesign and reformat of the cards. They previously battle contract three stats, your priority, your range, your power. 
and then there were other stats that could be tracked on cards, most notably your stun guard. In addition, four, they've added stun guard as a key ability to the four attributes that are tracked on each card, which in my mind makes a lot of sense. What doesn't make a lot of sense is the way that these attributes on the cards are ordered. And I didn't think about that the first time, or even the first dozen times that I played. I was teaching a friend of mine how to play at work, and he said, if you're going to be tracking priority first, why is it not at the top of the list? I looked down at my cards and realized, yeah, he's right. Anytime you flip over your cards, the very first thing you do is you check for starter beat effects. But after you've finished checking for starter beat effects, you immediately move to checking for priority to see who's the active player. So because priority are the first two stats that you're going to be comparing, why on earth would they not be at the top of the card? It doesn't make any sense. It's far more logical to put the priority at the top of the card because you're going to because you'll be checking that first, and then in most cases you'll be checking your range, then your damage, then your guard. But the abilities aren't ordered like that on the card, which seems like a strange thing to not change, especially when you're doing a fourth version and adding a stat line to those four stats you're tracking on every card. These are of course just minor grievances. Battlecon is great. I love getting a chance to play it more. I love exploring new characters. Despite having the game for a couple years now, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of characters that I've played and I'm always itching to jump back in and learn about other characters and how they play. So I will definitely be playing Battlecon more in the future and I'll probably be talking about it here more. I apologize. But that's Battlecon designed by D. Brad Dalton and published by Level 99 Games. I also had a chance to play Porta Nigra. This is a game designed by Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer and is published by Stronghold Games. This is a game that takes place in uh, ancient Roman times in the city, I believe, of Porta Nigra, uh, the, the Black Gate. I don't know much about it historically, but I know that this is a pretty good game. Porta Nigra is a game that falls under the umbrella of solid Euro designs that aren't particularly remarkable in any real way, so they tend to fly entirely beneath the radar. It's a game that most people probably haven't heard of, even though it's really pretty good. I think I got it for 8 bucks on a sale on uh, Cool Stuff Inc. And even after I got it, it sat on my shelf for probably a year before I finally cracked it open and gave it a shot. Everybody has room for a couple of these types of games on their shelves. They aren't one of the smash hits that crop up year by year, but they're quiet, strong designs that may not be the most exciting in art or theme or mechanics, but are tight, enjoyable, competitive experiences. In my mind, I compare it to a game like Firenze or The Pillars of the Earth. Strong, solid designs that you almost never hear about because they don't, for whatever reason, catch on popularity. Nava Gador is also a great example, one of Matt Garrett's criminally underappreciated designs. I almost never hear anybody talk about it, but it is phenomenal. For whatever reason, it just never caught on, and in a way I attribute that to simply the sheer volume of games that come out these days. Same with Porta Nigra. This is a game that if it had been released 15 years ago, it probably would have been a really big hit. But as it is, it was released in 2015, and so I'm sure it just got buried under the weight of all the releases that were coming out that year. It's got a really cool action selection mechanic where you have a hand of cards, namely a hand of two cards, that you'll be replenishing every turn from a small deck that you start with. And all those cards have a number of actions on them, and you can choose which of those actions you want to activate. You can activate three per turn, and then you've got some options for activating more. The object of the game is primarily to score points by picking up building blocks and placing them on certain areas of the city and trying to capitalize your score in that way. The game suffers a bit from all the tiles being an ugly gray color, but the more I look at it, the more I realize that there's really no way to get around that. Each brick has to be able to represent five different colors, and so you could try splitting up all the bricks and painting them all five of the different colors. That seems like an arduous task, and realistically, I don't know if it would actually work out for you because you might run out of one color right when you need it, and that would be a shame. Realistically, I don't really have much to talk about mechanics-wise for Porta Nigra. None of it is something that would really surprise anybody. There's one really cool mechanic where at the mid-game point you can choose to score some bonus points or convert bonus points into money. I think that's a cool, interesting decision. But overall, like I said, this isn't a groundbreaking game. It isn't a fascinating game, but it's a solid, strategic enjoyable, competitive Euro-type game that I wouldn't necessarily recommend to just everybody to go out and buy, but if you have room in your collection for a medium-weight game that you'd like to be able to just pull out here and there and be able to play really easily, 
assuming you're into medium weight games, then this is a game that's totally worth the eight bucks if you can get it on sale. Uh, Porta Nigra, designed by Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer. It is published by Stronghold Games. Now on to the feature game of the week. We are talking about Betrayal at House on the Hill. This is a game designed by Bruce Glasgow, Rob Davio, Bill McQuillan, Mike Selinker, and Tewin Woodruff, and it is published by Wizards of the Coast. Now, I'm sure there's a story somewhere why this game has five designers accredited to it, because I can't imagine they needed five minds to put what we got together. So if anyone has any idea of why that turned out the way it was, please send me a message. I want to know. This seems like a strange game to discuss, I know, because it's a very, very old game. Typically, during one of the first two weeks of a month, I try to talk about a new game. And, and the plan was to talk about the Gugong expansion. Unfortunately, with COVID restrictions being heightened where I am, I wasn't able to get all the plays in of Gugong that I feel I would need to give a proper review for the game. So I'm taking a step away from that just for this week. And I picked up a game that I got a chance to play, realized why I haven't played it in a while, and then committed myself to never playing again. That's right, this past week saw my ultimate play of Betrayal at House on the Hill. And by ultimate, of course, I mean the last time I will be playing it. Betrayal is a strange, strange situation. I cannot think of any other game that is so widely recognized as being a mediocre to downright poor quality game, and yet is still defended ardently by its community. No, 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 really. I have heard this statement more times than I can count. Well, yeah, Betrayal isn't a very good game, but it's a good experience. Or something like, it's not about the game. It's about the stories you can tell by playing the game. Now, I find these statements absolutely baffling because I, you know what, here, let me give you my background with Betrayal first. I first played Betrayal at House on the Hill probably about nine years ago at a dinner party. And at the time, I enjoyed it just fine. This was early into my foray of modern designer board games. At the time, I think my collection consisted only of Shadows Over Camelot, Pandemic, and Cosmic Encounters. So at the time, the concept of Betrayal was really very cool. It didn't play like any other games I'd seen before. I loved the way your haunts were determined randomly. I liked how unlikely it was to actually repeat a haunt unless you played it a lot. I thought the tile system for uncovering rooms was a cool idea because I hadn't played any modern dungeon crawlers. So I suppose for clarification, to a degree, I can understand why people like Betrayal. Again, at least to a degree. The rules are simple and accessible, or at least most of the time, but we'll get to that in a little bit. The modular element of building the board is something that's cool, and it's got a nice, moderately spooky theme tacked onto it. But back to my experience. My wife really quite liked Betrayal as well, in fact, even more than I did. So our next acquisition when it came time to buy new board games was, well, we picked up Betrayal at House on the Hill. And then we proceeded to play it. A lot. In fact, for a couple years, it was my wife's go-to game for just about any group, any get-together. This was a problem because it wasn't long after we bought the game that it started to wear on me. Really, within the first four or five plays. For the first couple times we played, it was still a fresh and exciting experience. But by game five or so, I found myself getting very tired of it. And then, after another handful of plays, I realized that I hated Betrayal. Every time it got pulled out, I just bit my tongue and let it happen to me. Because that's what it felt like. Something horrible was being forced upon me. Like grandma's fruitcake when you go home for the holidays. Now, I admit that the reason I hated it this much is because the game grew tired for me. But I have not had a game grow tired for me this quickly since Munchkin. And I've seen this happen with just about everybody that I've played this game consistently with. The first two times you play. It's a really cool experience. The flavor text on the events is fun and spooky. Finding rooms with special abilities is exciting. Rolling the dice to determine if a haunt is going to happen is a great moment where you're biting your nails. I mean, really, I can remember that very first game, drawing cards and reading the, the spooky text on the cards and having everybody in the room kind of get into it. It was a lot of fun. The problem is that these things quickly go stale. There aren't a ton of cards in the box for events, for haunts, for items, for anything. So after only a handful of plays, about four or five, you're going to start to recognize most of the stuff that you're drawing. You're going to have read the spooky text on the card several times. 
you're going to know what all the rooms do already. And what at first was a game of ambiance and theme has quickly turned into a rote and sepid experience. Or, or at least until the haunt occurs. One of the hallmark aspects of Betrayal at House on the Hill are the haunts. A book of, I don't know, 30 scenarios, roughly, somewhere around there, which are different end conditions for the game. A number of different factors determine which haunt you'll be playing with. How many cards you had drawn before it happened, where you were, I think, can sometimes determine who your character is, might come into play, I can't recall. And in theory, the haunt is what's supposed to make the experience for Betrayal. It's what the game builds up to. It's the final exciting climax that pits the players against each other in a final frantic struggle to see who can top the others. Except that's not what it does. 90% of your haunts boil down into two situations. Either the haunt occurs too early and the betrayer has a massive advantage on the rest of the group, or it occurs way too late and the group has an easy win because they've got a ton of items, the mansion's been almost explored, and everybody already knows where everything is. In each of these situations, you play the game, you trigger the haunt, and then it just kind of ends in an entirely unsatisfying way. Because the struggle, the tension, the final climactic moment where you're playing against each other, it just isn't there. Now, this isn't a complaint about the game not being competitive. A single play will show you that Betrayal is not meant to be a balanced competitive experience. The problem is that the very narrative and flow of the game is either cut off early before it can escalate to something that's exciting and enjoyable, or it drags on to the point where you're just finally glad to have it over. At the end of the game, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, but what does matter is that the game ends and you feel like something exciting or something fun happened. Oftentimes in games like this, that exciting and fun feeling comes from that neck-to-neck -neck race, both sides competing against each other trying to get ahead. That doesn't happen in Betrayal on House on the Hill. Instead, the haunt gets revealed, everybody looks at the board, and again, in 90% of your games, everyone's going to have a pretty solid idea of who's going to win. Now, of course, that's not always the case. There can be upsets in case of bad die rolls, and should you be lucky enough to have a situation like that, sure, it can be an enjoyable experience. But that's not overly common. What's frustrating about this is that there is exciting tension early on in the first half of the game. When you roll the haunt dice early in the game, it's a great tense moment. You don't want a haunt to happen yet. Until it does, and then that anxiety and tension almost entirely evaporates, especially if it happens early. Now that's not to say that there aren't moments where you have that great neck-to-neck -neck race. 10% of the time, the haunt is going to hit at just that right moment, and those games are easily the most enjoyable of Betrayal at House on the Hill, but they just don't come up enough. And maybe understandably so. Each haunt is distinct enough from the others that there are maybe just too many factors to consistently have a fun, exciting scenario every game. This could be a weakness in the core design of the game itself, but I can't say for sure because of how random everything is determined. Either way, this aspect makes the game feel like it's a game from the early 90s, early 2000s, which ultimately it is. I really want to stress the point, though, that the core issue here is not balance. It's not that this is not a proper competitive game where once the hunt triggers, the good side is perfectly balanced against the bad side, and now it turns into a fantastic strategy game where everybody has to make every action count if they're going to win. I don't expect that from this game, but what I do expect is I do expect to at least be in the running. I don't even mind starting at a decent disadvantage. What I do mind is when that haunt triggers and everybody looks at the board and you immediately know who's almost certainly going to win. That doesn't make for a good story or an interesting experience. Another major issue is the way the game almost seems to actively work against its core audience. See, Betrayal strikes me as the type of game that is meant to be played with new players. Those first couple of plays really are the best plays that you can get from this game. The rules seem simple. It's thematic enough to draw new players and make the experience immersive. In many ways, Betrayal at House on the Hill feels like a fantastic gateway game, akin to Catan, Carcassonne, or Ticket to Ride. Or at least it would be if, again, it wasn't for the haunt. I said before that the rules for this game are ostensibly simple. That's because what you're doing for the first half of this game is very simple. Move, pull out a room tile, see what happens, roll some dice. But more often than not, once a haunt triggers, you've got to delve back into the rulebook. And that's when things get frustrating. Random rules that are going to be used in only one out of maybe 20 games start cropping up. 
rules that you'll never remember because you read the rule book a year ago and this has never come up since. So you've got to grapple with new rules like attacking other players or stealing things from other players that are added on top of whatever changes the scenario adds. And really quite a few of these are a bit ambiguous. The rule book is not clear on how specific interactions are supposed to take place, especially because the scenario can change up some of the base aspects of the game pretty considerably. Now maybe all this doesn't seem so bad for you. After all, if you're the betrayer, you've read the rule book. You're going to know what's going on, or at least you'll have an idea of what you can do. But what if you're not the betrayer for the round? What if it's your mom? Or your grandma? Or your cousin who up until now said his favorite game is Cards Against Humanity? I can't tell you how many times I've played this game with new players only to have one of the new players trigger the haunt and become the betrayer. Sometimes that works out fine, but lots of times it just ruins the experience and becomes frustrating for the betrayer or the group or both. Because now you've taken what was once a cooperative move and roll game and turn it into an asymmetrical game where one side is likely very far behind and either one side or, or maybe both sides don't really understand what's going on now that we've drastically changed the rules and what you're supposed to be doing. And so, no, I don't get it. I don't understand the rabid endearment for betrayal at House on the Hill. I've had plays of it that have been enjoyable. The problem is that every time you sit down to play, you're basically tossing the dice just to see whether or not it's going to work out in an interesting way. And like I said, it baffles me when I see people defend this game. It's not about the game. It's about the experience. It's about the stories that came from playing it. It really seems like to have that kind of experience, you'd have to work very, very hard a lot of the time. And honestly, I just don't see the appeal of having to put that kind of effort in. When I'm playing a game, part of the reason I'm playing is to be entertained, and it doesn't make sense to me to play a game where I have to make my own fun. And as I scroll through comments and reviews on Board Game Geek and on other places, I see a lot of people that seem to want to play the game for just that reason, because they want to make their own fun while playing, and not in a sandboxy, I'm going to do my own thing way, in a I'm going to force fun into this game by telling myself that I'm creating a great experience and I'm telling a great story. But even then, from that standpoint, I don't understand what great stories people think they're telling here. Hey man, remember that time we played and you turned into a werewolf? But then I was in the room with the bullets and we killed you like three turns later? That was wild. Was it wild? There are so many great thematic and immersive games out there. Why is there so much focus on this one? Think about all the stories you can get from playing a dudes on a map game like Rising Sun, which for all of its faults has been a great game for coming up with stories about betrayal, winning out of nowhere, dropping big monsters on the board, sudden upsets, things like that. Heck, if you want a simple narrative driven game, Tales of Arabian Nights has been creating great stories that you can retell for like 35 years. You want a dungeon crawler? Pick up any of the Dungeons and Dragons dungeon crawler type games. Castle Ravenloft, a game like that. There are games that, in my opinion, are a little simplistic for dungeon crawler games, but that's perfectly fine for somebody that wants to play a game on the complexity level of Betrayal at House on the Hill. And you have the added benefit of having a game that seems to have quite a bit more thought put into it. It's one of the reasons why this game having so many designers is so strange to me. Did they just have some people that wrote up some of the scenarios get listed as designers? Was it a Ponzi scheme? I don't know what a Ponzi scheme is, but it sounds like a good excuse, so I'm going to go with that Ponzi scheme. In conclusion, I can't really recommend Betrayal at House on the Hill to anybody. At least not for purchase. Betrayal is one of the few examples of games that I think are really ideal for renting if you've got a local gaming store that rents out games. The basic rules are simple enough that you can learn them and teach them really quickly. You can skip all the extra rules until you're unfortunate enough to need them. But if you rent it, get a few plays in, then you can return it when you start to recognize things like rooms and cards. And in case it's not clear, I highly recommend you do not try playing the game until you've done each and every haunt. I know that to be a big mistake, but I'm not going to tell you why. Yet despite all this, Betrayal at House on the Hill has an audience. It has a large following. And I certainly don't mean to denigrate anybody that enjoys playing this game. But I feel comfortable saying that I don't understand you, <laughs> at least in this respect. I could see it being on the shelf of a individual that likes just playing light, simple games. 
I suppose in that regard, sure. Maybe recommend it to somebody that doesn't want to delve too deeply into into anything above a light to maybe light medium game. For anybody that likes playing medium, heavier strategy euros, heavier American games, I just cannot see this being one that you'd really want. This opinion, of course, coming 16 years after it was published. So realistically, if you are interested in Betrayal at House on the Hill, you probably already know that you like Betrayal at House on the Hill. And if you do, more power to you. But I shall not be playing it again. I've done, I've paid my dues. I've played it enough. Realistically, I easily got my money out of it. I just wish that journey had been a more pleasant experience than it was. So, again, that was Betrayal at House on the Hill. It is designed by Bruce Glasgow, Rob Daviel, Bill McQuillan, Mike Selinker, and Tuwin Woodruff. And it is published by Wizards of the Coast, or at least it was. I believe it's out by Asmodee now. But my copy was Wizards of the Coast. Well, I've ranted and raved, and I've probably been wrong enough this episode so far, so I'm going to cut it off here. I'd like to wish you a great weekend. Please email me at learnyourownrules at gmail.com, or maybe tweet me at LYO Rules. Um, still working on getting access to it. More on that later. But we're coming up on the weekend. Go out, play games, have fun. And as we say here, game on. Thank you for listening to the Learn Your Own Rules podcast. This podcast is created, produced, directed, and edited by Ryan Krim. Please send help.